Quentin Tarantino is a visionary. Nothing the guy does in his movies is regular. Exceptional stories, exceptional events, and exceptional characters. You simply would not find your every jaws in Quentin Tarantino's filmography. But for the most part, we as an audience did a good job reading Tarantino's characters, even the most unorthodox or complex ones. We understood the majority of them all but one. As a result of that, one of Cutie's deepest characters is often seen as one-dimensional even by die-hard Tarantino fans. Yes, I'm talking about the major Marquise, yes, I'm going to tell you all about it, and yes, we are going to fully spoil the hateful eight. Fellow film enthusiasts, we are going to decipher Tarantino's most misunderstood character. Chapter 1. Face Value Major First of all, we need to understand what the character represents at face value. How other characters in a movie see him? And for that, we should look no further than the first ever scene of the movie. Let me just pause here and explain the situation Major Marquis has found himself in. So his horse just died. And Warren is left with three dead bodies and one dead horse in the middle of nowhere. The closest known shelter is Minis Haberdashery and the only way to get there before the blizzard catches up is with a horse or a stagecoach. His horse is dead and this is the very last stagecoach of the day, and a private one at that. Well, this ain't the normal line. So if John Rus had not decided to carry Daisy Domergue to Red Rockets this very day, Major was a goner. Does he look like a guy who was saved by a scene chance just now? Nope. And do not think that Quentin just did not pay enough attention to the details. A few minutes later, we see another passenger in the same shoes as Major, and let me tell you that he's acting very differently. So, to sum up, the first ever scene of Major Marquis highlights one of his most definitive character traits. He's a survivor. He's accustomed to the danger so much that he can control himself very well while facing death, and he's no stranger to close escapes from it. We learn a bit of a backstory during the stagecoach drive, it contributes to building the facade of Major Warren. He's a war veteran, he's one of the most decorated representatives of people of color, and he does everything in his powers to achieve the goals. Shoot him, stab him, drown him, burn him. Warren does not have any issues with the amount of people he killed and the way he did it. He's also so successful that he's pen pals with Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln, the President of the United States? We will dive deeper into this later. He also is kind of a cutthroat. Being a bounty hunter is generally a dirty line of work, but there are some morally correct ways to do that. Wouldn't transporting her be easier if she were dead? Well, no one said the job was supposed to be easy. And then there are Major's ways. My bounties never hang. Cause I never bring him in alive. To conclude Major Warren's characteristics at face value, we need to have a look at one more scene. Major Warren is black. And that's quite often the first and the only thing that people notice about him. Do you know that nigga, sir? I don't know that nigga. But I know he's a nigger. What's more telling is that this comes from a war general. Sandy Smithers has just seen a black major, which is a big, big rarity in this movie's world by all accounts, but he does not acknowledge the uniforms that Warren wears, all he's focused is his skin color. So this is a proper short summary of face value characteristics of Major Marquis. He's confident decorated black for veteran, and that is the way the world knows him. Chapter 2. Inner Warren so we have seen how Major Warren is presented to the world, but what about the way he sees himself? The biggest characteristic that he displays over and over is self-awareness. Major knows who he is and he knows how the world is constructed. He can freely assume the position of power when the opportunity presents itself, but he also knows when to take a back seat. Once again, it's highlighted in a perfect contrast with Chris Mannix. When the freeloaders appear out of thin air, John Roos gets nervous and he demands that they wear handcuffs. Just a minute ago, Major was enjoying the deep conversation, but when the tables are turned, he accepts to be humiliated at the cost of survival. You know who does not accept it? Chris Mannix. No. The guy that just now was freezing to death and was pleading for help. Chris has pride that is usually only attributed to the people who come from a privileged upbringings, and based on this he makes unreasonable decisions, but he can back it up with quick wits. You let me die? That's murder. 
Chris is not accustomed to being humiliated and he's willing to die before willingly accepting the symbol of humiliation. Warren is accustomed to all this. And he's the survivor. So he will take the towel at the moment only to come back stronger. It does not mean that Warren is this pushover that can be submitted easily. For the most part he's pretty pushy himself. He's just good with calibrating the power dynamics. Later in the story when Warren partners up with John Roos, he's actively making people uncomfortable, testing the limits of his newly established powers. He confronts Bob in the burn, he disarms Joe Gage with force, he belittles General Smithers with the graphic inappropriate imagery and he kills him in quote-unquote self-defense. But at the same time, it's not all uplifting for Major. During the dinner, he's confronted by Chris Mannix about the letter. Warren does not act up and flows with the conversation. And in the true Mannix fashion, Chris laughs his soul out and Major takes another L. When the core is broken, there is no point in fighting an uphill battle. So Marquis laughs along to another one of his humiliations. Speaking of the killing in self-defense, let's talk about the general. So Smithers is truly a pitiful human being. He's a southern general, and while we are not going to dive deep into historical implications, he's all about the main characteristic of southern forces of time period. General is extremely racist. He also lacks any kind of empathy. One minute he was playing chess with Sweet Dave, and the second moment he's shaking hands with the guys that just killed him and all the rest of Minnie's employees. And Tarantino also went out of his way to make him the least sympathetic possible. He talks down about his brothers and he proudly admits that marrying his wife was a good business deal. General just does not have anything genuine in his life. Tarantino does all this to make us cheer for Warren when, based on the story that he's telling, we really should not. Yeah, go on Major, destroy this motherfucker's whole life, imprint the image of his son sucking big Black Johnson as the last thing that he imagines in his life and already kills this crippled fucker. Hell yeah! To get back to the constructive analysis, Major really indulges himself in the violence against the people who in his eyes deserve it. Not that General Smithers was a good guy, but probably there wasn't an avenue to get rid of him in a civiler way. But where would have been fun in that? Get it. Warren is also smart. He reads the room very quickly, he can sneak his way around anyone and anything. Marquis can manipulate people. He can create and commit to lifelong lies. He can solve the mysteries on his own. And the best thing is that nobody expects him to be this clever and the shock value really works in his favor. Chapter 3 True Marquis we discovered who people think Major Marquis is and we discussed who he thinks he is. Most of the movie's audience probably got this far pretty comfortably. Now we shall try to understand who he truly is. Lot of the qualities that we discussed still apply of course. He's confident, he's black, he is very successful decorated war veteran. Major is smart. Major can adjust to the circumstances and the power dynamics. But what is the driving force for Marquis Warren in life? The biggest burden for Major has been his most obvious quality, that he cannot change or hide. Major is black and in this story's world that's not an advantage. In the most places and situations he's gonna be treated according to just that and nothing else. So Major learns to not care about that attitude too much and keep his composure against even very direct mockeries. He also tried to fabricate his way out of the status, creating the fake Lincoln letter, seeing that is no good to him in usual life or death situations, but also the leverage that allows him to play long cons against the likes of John Roos. And we see how committed he is to this leverage, punching Daisy and throwing his saver John Roos out of the stagecoach. It displays the effect that the letter has on others as well. Sure, John Roos was not happy with being thrown out of the stagecoach, but he still treated this incident as fair course of action by Major Marquis, all because of the Lincoln letter. But even with all these tactics, Marquis cannot escape the cruel world. And he might learn to keep his composure when being judged without being warranted, but it's all piling up in his mind and soul. During the stagecoach drive, we learned that there was a significant bounty for Warren's head, and there were plenty of suitors for that. So Major faced countless threats for years, and he learned how to be vigilant, how to expect threats everywhere. Warren is an Avenger. 
He survives all these near death scenarios against all odds, only to fight another day. And fighting for Major is to demolish as many people that wronged him and his race as possible. I want to weigh in on Warren's mindset when he enters the haberdashery. As we discussed, Major just escaped a very likely death. But it should all be in the past. Here is one of the safest public places for him on this earth. It should be fine. But it is not. Instead of Mini, guests are met by Bob. This is unexpected and unusual. There is something cheesy. After doing the task assigned, Major volunteers to help out in the burn in order to interrogate this Bob guy. He's not shy of admitting that much, and he does not like what he finds out. But there is nothing conclusive yet. Then Marquis enters the haberdashery, the rare place where he can always count on a warm welcome. In his own words, uh, This may be Minnie's place, but this is damn show. Sweet days, Chen. So Herbert de Sherry is specifically Minis, not his husband's and not shared. That makes Mini one of the most successful representatives of black culture herself. Warren is respecting Mini. Even though her no heads policy is ignored by everyone else, Major obeyed it upon entering and during the dinner time. He was expecting to be welcomed by Mini, to relax and enjoy the safe warm place while the blizzard was raging outside. But this is what he gets instead. This ain't right, and someone has to die for it. Not only that, but right before he starts taking things into his own hands, his lie about the letter is exposed. The only leverage that he ever had against white folks just slipped out of his hands and he has to smile along it and try to make John Roos a bigger victim of this whole ordeal. How does Major act on this? Does he settle down and let others enjoy their moment? Hell no. He right away approaches General and executes a carefully calculated master plan to kill him and make it count as self-defense. Warren is a pitiful, vengeful human that does not fully admit it to himself. Almost all his acts are for vengeance against somebody. He killed General's boy in a graphic manner because of his father and the Battle of Baton Rouge. By the way, I do believe Warren's story, maybe not a bit about Big Black Johnson, but some version of the story should have happened in my mind. And he killed General because of his boy and his unreasonable goals. What can be very easily overlooked is how much Major enjoys life. He's a traumatized, hateful person, a hitting stove that can explode in any moment, but he can also be amused by even the smaller things. Including shitting out 15 extra gang members whenever you need be. Warren and Manning's dynamics are very important. They were name calling each other by their race earlier and they both meant it as insults. Least of all, that nigga there. I heard him here, Billy. And they continue to do that to the end, but it seems more like a friendly banter as time goes by, not an insult anymore. I ain't dead yet, you black bastard. When parts of both their facade is off, they look quite similar. It was only on my latest rewatch that I discovered that when Chris reads Lincoln letter in the very last scene, Warren lip syncs every word the whole time. He does consider himself a potential difference maker in a better world, but in the world that he's stuck in, his talents are wasted on being just a resourceful, vengeful survivor. I kept the best part for last. The most revealing part for Warren's true self is a climactic confrontation. It brings out his best and worst qualities. When Major killed General, somebody used the destruction to their advantage and poisoned the coffee. John Roos and Obi die, so now's the time for conspirators to strike, but Major Warren happens. So here we need once again to look at the scene when Marquis enters the haberdashery and break it down from yet another additional layer. Marquis walks into a haberdashery, the temple of the success of black community. He used to receive a warm welcome here, but not today. Right away, Major needs to withstand racist comments. No mini, no minis rules, no safety. There are eight people in the room. Two are openly racist, four of them conspire against him and his only buddy John Roos, and the only other person is Obi, who might be friendly, but does not have any power whatsoever and dies a meaningless death alongside Major's only ally, John Roos. At the very point when John Roos and Obi die, Major has no friends left. Four out of five remaining people wish him dead. By all accounts, he should be a goner. But we shall remember that Major is a survivor and extremely self-aware. He utilizes his only advantage, being armed and takes control. Then he recruits Chris Mannix to his co 
draws and distributes his power to him. Let that sink in. Guy who entered the haberdashery a few hours ago, being considered as the lowest person, who was humiliated over and over again, who has seen his only ally die a horrible death, asserts power in a room full of enemies and delegates this power to the new sheriff of Red Rock. So, you finally decided I'm telling the truth about being the sheriff of Red Rock, huh? That's who Major is, that's what he does. There is no challenge that he does not expect and that he cannot maneuver through. Life has thrown all the worst shit at him, so Warren started to learn how to deal with it. What follows is probably my favorite Tarantino scene of all time. I cannot even explain how cool it is on so many levels. It's a weird mix of Ezekiel 2517 from Pulp Fiction and Poirot's epiphany monologues from Agatha Christie novels and all this is glamorized in a pure western style. Now, I am calling you a liar, Senor Bob. And if you lying, which you are, then you killed many. And three days. Just how cool it is. Outside of the opening of Inglorious Busters, this is a scene that Tarantino stretches the shit out of the most. Let's slow it down. Let's slow it way down. And it does wonders. No reveal from a whodunit story has given me more chills than Major Warren uncovering the mystery of the poisoned coffee. It is that good. And don't forget Chris Manick's important contribution. Or we go by my theory. Which is the ugliest guy did it. I love how Chris is probably the most sympathetic character left at this point, but he still remains a slave of the first impressions. To get back on track quickly, Major outs Bob as a liar and kills him. He makes Joe Gage admit about a poisoned coffee. We are not that far from catching Mowbray in his lies as well, but the bullet from the bottom and Major is fatally wounded. We said earlier, there is no challenge that Marquis is not ready for, and this was correct for all the visible challenges. But Major's ultimate downfall was the hidden threat, bullet from the bottom. Since nobody ever cared to second-guess themselves before insulting Marquis, he was simply untrained to detect an invisible threat. He can read the room, look for clues, he can find the correct suspects to the mysteries, but Warren cannot keep track of invisible threats. Life prepared him for a lot of harsh things, but not for this. Major dies because up to this point life has been so obviously cruel to him. No hidden agendas whatsoever. Even injured, Warren brings this to the end. And this time Chris's contribution is real. Warren set a good example for him. Both admitting their ultimate downfall, couples share their last laugh in the fantasy of pen pal Lincoln and the caring world by extension. They also decide to pay respect to John Ruth's memory and indulge themselves to the last act of violence, even though probably a justified one. Warren and Mannix have come a long way, but they have not become heroes. They are not the material for that kind of thing. They are still part of the hateful late. Conclusion Like the ending of the last chapter so much, that debated if I should have ended there. But no, this one actually requires summary. Before we do that, if you remained until now and hopefully enjoyed yourself, please consider liking and subscribing. So, here the summary goes. We have shown that Major Warren is a layered character. There are things to be seen at face value, the things that he acknowledges about himself and the things that he does not fully know about himself. Above all else, Major is a survivor, smart, manipulative and resourceful. He knows when to push his agenda and when to take his losses without resistance. But swallowing up his pride does not go without its toll, all this remains it to Warren's psyche and they contribute to the occasional violent outbursts. Walt has prepared Marquis for the harshest of the environments, he learned to understand, adapt and survive harsh situations against all odds. Major always starts at the bottom because of his skin color, but knows his way to the top. Cruelty of the world also has contributed to curve him as a tough person, but it also ensured that he would have a single blind spot. What he never counted for was a hidden threat and it ended up becoming the cause of his downfall. Major Marquis was not a hero, even by Tarantino standards. He was a flawed character, but a very consistent one to his core and with lots of potential for greater things in a better world, but not in his own real one. I hope I played at least a small part in solving this puzzle of Tarantino's most thrilling and misunderstood character.
If you want to watch more movies about the modern westerns, click on the video on your screen. Say adios to you.